Hey, drop. AI FISEC today, the pulse of innovation where the digital frontier meets physical security. I'm your host, Don Marone, and I am thrilled to have you join us on this electrifying journey through the world of AI and physical security. We're here today to dive into the heart of innovation, exploring cutting edge ideas, and breakthrough technologies that are reshaping the way we protect our physical spaces. Whether you're a tech enthusiast, a physical security professional, or just fascinated by the transformative power of AI, you're in the right place. So get ready to be inspired by our industry experts who are here to share their passion, their projects, and their unique insights into the future of security. Fasten your seatbelts and let's embark on this thrilling journey together on AI FISEC today. So today's guest, we have Lance Halloway, who is a CTO of ESI Convergent for today's podcast topic, that is the end user's journey to embracing AI and physical security. Um, super excited to talk about this, Lance. Uh, this has been something that we have some end users that are uh, listening into the podcast. And for someone that sells to end users, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and, and looking forward to learning from someone um, that's an industry vet uh, like yourself. So if you could tell the audience just about yourself, including one fun fact, just so they can get to know you a little better. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you for that. So um, a little bit about myself. I've been in the physical security industry for about 30, 32 years or so. Started as an electrician and uh, got pulled into uh, our industry uh, from which no one ever escapes. And um, started as an installer, went to project management, went to the dark side into sales for a while. And then I went into engineering and support and began doing uh, business to business uh, database connectivity. And uh, at that point, probably around 2001, I started the professional engineering services group over at, uh, it's now Securitas. That group is still going, quite a few engineers there to handle anything from um, advanced support and escalation to preventative maintenance on enterprise class systems, um, ghost in the machine, uh, a lot of the troubleshooting going on there. We need veterans that are IT uh, skill set and physical security skill set and door hardware uh, skill set. And I, I mentioned that as a, a subset of all of that, but any of those could be an issue at a, a customer site. Uh, did that for quite some time and then went into um, technical marketing and commercialization, trying to launch products for our sales teams and to hear the voice of the customer in different verticals and make sure that the technology applied correctly. Nothing like trying to stick a, a square peg into a round hole, right? So some uh, verticals and requirements, regulatory, have different appetites, if you will, or different technology metabolisms, and trying to make sure that's right size and, and fit correctly. And so with that, for about the last 15 plus years, I've worked with a lot of technology manufacturers in our space to uh, help them get connected to the right folks in, in the right verticals, uh, to help them do gap analyses uh, against, you know, maybe uh, expectations of what technology can do in that space and what may be missing, or really to advocate and to bright line. Uh, a lot of times we'll find a, a technology and an innovation group that needs to be heralded, right? And they get buried. There's a lot of marketing. There's a lot of technology expertise in our space. And it can get muddy for customers trying to really find the right solution. And so that's uh, another element of what I do. And even today, no longer an integrator, uh, working with ESI Convergent as a consultant. So I take care of end users. I sit down and uh, work through their uh, one, three, five-year roadmap uh, to compare technology stacks, help them organize against the requirements from IT, um, incident management, legal, human resources, et cetera to craft something that works for them. It's not necessarily a specific logo that can take care of all that level. It, it really is an architected solution and then helping people understand how to walk through implementing that and supporting it long-term. So that is, um, you know, kind of what we're, we're doing today in, in part of our conversation is how to, how to digest what's going on with uh, the AI elephant in the industry, so to speak, and the best way to do that. Um, fun thing about me. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not really quite sure because fun is a relative term. So uh, I went to seminary instead of uh, planning on getting into physical security. Um, I've played video games and worked on computers pretty much my whole life. And um, I like cigars and, and whiskey. 
and um, I enjoy our industry quite a bit. So, and I've got five kids, and they are all over the United States. So that's awesome. What's your uh, what's your game vice? What do you? Yeah, what do you I'm, go to? I'm really into uh, colony management, uh, builders, survival kind of stuff. Uh, there's so many nice. genres out there that, that throw a challenge at you. Can you? survive in this situation can you build something in this with these resources and uh it's a lot of fun it really has changed radically since my first atari so uh pitfall <laughs> and uh you know um yeah. pong and all those uh, a billion years ago so anyway it's changed just a little bit uh um, yeah a little bit <laughs> I'm I'm so I'm glad you didn't say any RPGs because everybody's like I'm Call of Duty or something like that. Um I actually just beat Prince of Persia uh, oh, nice. recently that just got released in 2024 so yep. solid game um if you're into that but it includes puzzles as a part of the gaming yep. experience which is pretty yep. awesome exactly um yeah so let's let's talk right so the topic just as a reminder is the end user's journey to embracing ai and the physical security um a lot where you can start a lot where you can end with that i love the aspect of the journey cuz that already helps me understand there's a story that's involved, right? From a logical start to a logical end. Um, kick us off. Tell us where you're you're looking to start and we'll get the conversation going. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I think one of the, the really positive things about working with Stanley Black and Decker at the time is um, they were always pushing the edge to be innovative, right? And um, mm -hmm. so with that, they had started... Um, you know, AI, digital transformation early, early on, pulled in some key resources from some major players in, in the uh, in the world, not just in the industry, uh, to, to make that happen. They were always uh, courageous enough to look into the crystal ball and try to see what was coming with analytics, et cetera. But having uh, been a, a programmer for me and, and knowing that a lot of our customer base uh, may have a physical security background or facilities or procurement background, right? Uh, uh, they're not all IT uh, folks. And so having, you know, done everything from uh, SQL or Oracle DBA certifications, uh, cybersecurity certifications, et cetera, to go ahead and digest that technology to bring that and then translate that in a digest to me to line of business owners who are not technology background, help them understand why something is a, a better total cost of ownership or better ROI. Yeah, it may be a Ferrari, but if you, you don't have a paved road to drive on, so to speak, that may not be the investment for you, right? Um, yeah. Because you want to avoid selling, uh, overselling a technology to a customer who's not able to drive it. And that's where you yes. really have to interview the customer and find out what's your technology metabolism. Are you an early adopter and bleeding edge is your revenue, or, you know, you need to wait and see if you other people cut the rug and, um, from there, kind of borrow their use cases, what they've learned, and you have spectrum all the way across, right? Um, there's some customers that they would beat us uh, just in a positive way. I need to know more. I need to know what else is out there. And we were finding entrepreneurs still in their garage with AI elements and things and just trying to get them plugged in. So at least they had conversation to move forward in visibility and, and hopefully the right uh, venture investments to help them move to the next phase. But then you had a lot of customers that were very uh, conservative. You know, the, the security dollar is hard won. Uh, certainly in, in a mm -hmm. lot of the disruptive environments that are going on, it's, it's a challenge mm -hmm. to ask for something that may be perceived as a luxury. And so, um, you know, first thing is gauging the customer, right? What's, what's the right fit for this customer? And, um, you know, there have been low-tech customers or customers without technology background help them hire um, what I call a nerd link. Get somebody on staff that reports to them that can do all the things, get in there and crank it all out, and you see them really excel their program at that point because now they have that resource available to them, but some of them don't know to identify what is the resource, what's the job description, what are the certifications, mm -hmm. et cetera. So helping them build their ability to do that. And then the other part of the, uh, the interview really is what are your, your use cases? Do you have a a bank vault, do you have a university stadium, do you have a, a harbor, um, you know, a tarmac? What what are your use cases? Because the technologies may vary based on that and um, you know, your requirements. So, you know, a lot of times uh, manufacturing blinders and sometimes integrator blinders are 
here's my three logos I'm allowed to sell. You're going to need this. Uh, I, you know, it cures world hunger. It does this. It slices. It dices. You need four of them. Here's a quote. And it's not solution providing. And so something I had the, the real privilege of doing a lot of times with the national and global accounts under Jerry Walker and Greg Copeland, Bob Stockwell, Marty Gray, uh, and Rosky, a lot of guys that are Securitas now, um, really sit down and architect a solution for the end user and, and really put that together and have that conversation. So one of those conversations today really is AI. <clears throat> People come out of the trade shows and conferences and they're intoxicated with all the marketing they've seen, right? They've seen some robot go down the, the aisle and do some things. Wow, it's amazing. And then they get back and the C-suite is like, there's almost like this social pressure to show that you're being innovative, right? To flex your knowledge of AI. And, and a lot of that's cool, but <clears throat> what I hate to see is um, I've seen early investment kind of throw the thing over the fence, bring in a bunch of resources, <clears throat> and then nobody knows how to appropriate or apply that technology. Um, I've seen data scientists get brought on, and everybody's talking, it never gets me on the slide deck, and maybe a cloud server. How do you, how do you get it to land on your security program planet and make it a, an actionable thing? So. With that, you really thin out the herd on the marketing, on the presentations, the things that are applicable. And then you're literally down to four or five products today that you, as a physical security user, um, probably could implement and actually get some real ROI as far as uh, reducing alarms or, or uh, better threat uh, indications or incident management, things like that. Um, but other than that, there's a whole lot of uh, fog being generated in the workspace. You know, you said something there, I think a few things that I can definitely relate with. One, um, not overselling, um, right? So I think the idea, you're right, there's a lot of shiny objects, a lot of good marketing, a lot of good sales pitches, but staying focused on the outcome. And I think that, you know, companies like yours is certainly doing that because you're only getting paid on the outcome. You're not getting paid on you know or maybe you are but i would imagine that you're there for a repeated business and uh you can't categorize a customer based on like you said the four things that someone has to their disposal right as opposed to um you know let's give a prescriptive offering right based on the outcome we need to achieve the other thing i noticed from from what you were saying is you had a programming background, which I think gives you a lot of empathy to how these things work and accept not just the AI tech and physical security, but like baseline implementation that's required, right? That to say, hey, you want to go into a cloud, but you need to modernize your databases first before we can right. try to do that. Oh, you want to create or, or you want to leverage some aspects of machine learning, but you have to have the data accessible, right? And some baseline tech knowledge or advanced technology allows you or affords you the opportunity to have those conversations that aren't necessarily inputs and outputs, right? Yeah. On an access control panel. So yeah. Um, and you bring a couple of your yeah. points are gone. Um uh, well first real quick, yeah, I don't work on commission for anything I sell. I don't see a dime as sort of any products that you as a customer I buy. You put me on or or the SI team on retainer, uh, and we sit down, we'll go through that about planning. And so mm -hmm. I have the liberty to say Man, this is gorgeous. We can take a, a look behind the curtain. They're about to be sold, right? And uh, mm -hmm. or they were sold 12 months ago, and their developers are you know in or out. And there's some other dimensions to it other than just a PowerPoint slide you saw. But um, you know, you mentioned about implementation. It's something that uh, I talk about often with with AI. You know, it, it's such a, a broad ranging category, and a lot of times when you talk to an end user. The IT department already has some kind of maybe a Splunk initiative or some kind of uh, data mining or some kind of element there. And I've done Splunk yeah. pseudocode for petrochem companies and stuff like that. But in the hands of a forensic investigator with a law enforcement background or, or, or something like that. But the, the linchpin is this. The times in previous companies where I've seen a real uh, big data implementation, implementation go in, for example, uh, at a major airport, we put in um, an SAP HANA system, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it went back forensically one year into the past. And the access control system, uh, the HR, some of the other areas, 
we had to have the subject matter expertise of Customs and Border Patrol and TSA investigators literally come in and go, these are the behavior flags I'm looking for. So you have to have a subject matter expert help you build the data model. Now, that's on mm. one hand. The other is is yeah. to tell it behaviorally, go learn the environment and then tell me when something doesn't look normal. That's another way of doing it. But for you to really, really leverage that deep data stuff, you've got to have a subject matter expert and then also have them take a look at the data that's coming back out of the AI. You know, it can come back with all these fun. You know, it's, oh, it's amazing. But, but a real veteran is going to look at it and go, that's cool. And that definitely tells me uh, another area to search. It's still off by a few degrees. And, and until you get a, a, a master, like you've probably seen it, you get a, a senior management veteran walking in and they see all the numbers for the quarter. Mm-hmm. And they can kind of go, wait, show me slide three. What's going on? And they can drill in because they know what the data really should say. Somebody has mm-hmm. to know that data. So one of the cool things I see about generative AI entering our space is that a non-technical subject matter expert can either type in or verbally give the ad hoc, unstructured query, if you will, and begin zeroing in on vast amounts of data they're looking for. That's that's the end game, right? Everything up to this point is, hey, I've got a library of five analytics that I'm looking for video-wise. Or I can set up a query to show me every time this happened in the history file, coupled with a timestamp, you know, I'm fusing a, a, a data view and I'm, I'm making that happen. Real AI, the real power, often will be in a cloud implementation because for me to price, implement, and maintain the servers and the software and the connectivity to make all that a real data farm, a data lake, and a data, data warehouse is a massive monumental effort. Not a lot of companies can do that. I've seen a lot of companies buy the software and years later it's still in the box, so to speak, because to get that driven to that point is crazy. Inversely, if you can subscribe to a cloud program that has maybe an agent on-prem, and there's a number of those that are emerging now, that alleviates the need for me to have the server ask with my IT, the licensing, et cetera, just boiled down into that cloud. So a real adoption slipstream, if you will, for, for big AI and big data make a cloud base. And I know there's some experts out there going, well, Bell, Lance, yeah, of course. But remember, our industry, physical security, not everybody's a cloud expert, not everybody's a, a data lake, data warehouse, data mart uh, expert, right? And so finding products today that are emerging that are subscription-based cloud, they have an agent or an appliance that lives on-prem that can connect your access control, your video, your HR, et cetera, your identity management. Those accelerate deployment and uh, total cost of ownership, too. I know it's a mouthful. <laughs> no, it's good. And by the way, I can just keep, I, I might just broaden what you're saying, but keep yeah. me on track with your agenda because I know you have a lot of good things probably planned out to say. Um, certainly, Gen AI was a catalyst into allowing everyone or make it, and I wrote this in my SIA uh, newsletter in December was that it was a catalyst to making AI accessible to the masses. Before, the best we could get was an unstructured, self-supervised learning, deep learning model, right? Which was very advanced. I mean, people did all kinds of great stuff with it. And now it's like at the place where, you know, I was was watching something from uh, Microsoft has Ignite every year, which is kind of their like tech release conference. And I saw a... A snippet of a lady that was a data scientist from Stanford. She created a platform where companies can make their own private LLMs over a few lines of code. So we're getting to the place where not only Gen AI was accessible through cheap AI use of OpenAI, Gemini, you know, to uh, Llama, uh, Llama 2 now, or I think it maybe it's at 3. Uh, there's thousands of these LLMs to now companies can make their own private versions of this Yep. We're fairly inexpensive. And what's amazing about that is that there's a ton of accessibility to manufacturers that will allow for way more opportunities for customers to start leveraging this stuff that they can actually afford. Because in the past, it just wasn't that way. Now people just have to get on board um, quickly with that. Uh, but I, I see great possibilities um, with that change. Uh, but it's amazing because this stuff changes every day. I, I get updates on TLDR, uh, try to read it every day that I can. 
something new is coming out. I mean, your phones are going to be completely different, you know, by the end of this year. Uh, some yeah. releases have already shown that um, mm -hmm. in the way that they function with natural language processing. But yeah, man. So just expanding on what you're saying, but you keep going. Yeah. Well, that, and uh, yeah. as you're talking there, then I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, there's uh, the accessibility and adaptability of technology in our space, right? And uh, as you mentioned, you know, a professor at Stanford and this person over here and uh, digital acceleration group over here, and they've created something in its science in their lab. Now go to your local, you know, Fortune 1000 and talk to the security director there and say, okay, you're ready to implement this. What's, what's that going to look like? Do I have to put servers in? Do I have to subscribe, et cetera? So, so on one vector, you've got the ease of accessibility and uh, of mm. use, right? And to your point, it, it is almost disruptive how radically that is advancing, which is it's wonderful. Now, the exigency of our industry to be correct and, and solvent, right? So as I am talking to major customers, who were early adopters of it and have raised care about data sovereignty now. Yes, I, there was an easy portal for me to get hooked up, get all these things going, and a bunch of nerds were running around and swipe my card and all this stuff happened. But by the way, I'm a global company and now my telemetry, my data, my information is now there in somebody else's cloud. And I don't have for sure, like in writing, you know, the big four, uh, you know, SOC 2 or whatever kind of, those all still have to be in place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a challenge because as easy as this stuff starts landing, you know, I went to Amazon, I bought five cameras, I went to this and it's got data and, and worse, accessibility, right? And some of the NDAA issues we've seen have been, well, there's a backdoor, it's a service backdoor and it can't be shut off. Really? You know, Homeland Security is listing a number of security products that we all know and and, and that was it. So when you go ask and they can't be shut off and, and suppressed on the back of the thing. And that's, you know, also the EULA. It's famous, right? All the mobile apps people are loading. Oh, I want to message this person. I want to do all this stuff. And they hit OK on a, a flashlight even app for their phone. And in the EULA, it's actually sucking out their contact information as the right to use their camera, you know, photos, all of that. And while that is so endemic now, it's really hard to stay on top of that uh, airtight for a corporate investment and a decision to try to put in a new fulcrum by which you're going to learn more about your security operations, get better responsiveness, situational awareness. You can't not, you, you can't have a back door or, or a vulnerability in the back end of that. And, and you got items like solar and stuff that, that within your power, there's no way you can control. Um, but that's, that's all world today, you know? Anyway, that was uh, another mouthful. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> yeah, um, true. Marvel nerds. Um, no, yeah, it's because the thing is, positives, some negatives, people have to balance that out. I think if they jump and they leap to something new, uh, there has to be some consideration. Last season, we had some folks on the call. A lot of that was, we talked to, we talked a lot about that topic. And I think the uh, the one thing that was very apparent is, that I think that people they have to under that AI needs to be explainable and so and such that that uh, it doesn't put the company in a liability situation, right? And that's a very vague thing I just said, but the reality is the big companies like the IBMs and the Microsofts, you know, and the the Metas, the ones that are in this space to build these LLMs by yeah. leveraging that tech, it puts the liability a lot of times in their seats. Yeah. But not really, too. It depends, right? Yeah. And well, I think there has to be some AI right. or data steward on site that has to take some responsibility over good use of it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's uh, no, no, I, it's something you said. It's true the, the whole conversation about uh, risk transference, right? So if you do mm -hmm. implement cloud and your contracts are signed and all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, you do have a degree of risk transference. Um, but just because someone else may be culpable or liable for something, liable um, doesn't mean your business will survive uh, that type of uh, thing. So it's just all going to be factored in, right? I mean, it depends on your business, right? If, if I'm sitting down to interview you, what is your uh, risk exposure? You know, um, you've got some financial institutions that, that will live or die by their data privacy. You've got some customers that are more uh, social event based. So it's all event incident management, um, 
you know, law enforcement uh, type things and, and data is just kind of there. It might be ticket sales, it might be uh, invites, things like that, but nothing um, that, that would risk if they're a little bit different. Yeah. So what happens next in the end user journey? I think you talked about avoid overselling. Um, you know, we talked about ease of accessibility. We talked about risk transference. What do we think happens next in the in kind of that journey, that process? Well, you know, um, you had asked um, a question for me to have ready about kind of a pet project or something like that, and mm -hmm. something I'm, I'm extremely passionate about and I've worked on for years in, in different capacities. But uh, we're, we're kind of pulling the trigger this year is to have an independent um, research lab and enterprise mm -hmm. um, production environment, right? Mm -hmm. So at a, um, a, a gathering, we'll be putting it in Denver. And uh, we're reaching out to various manufacturers who want to have their mm -hmm. products running in a correctly tuned enterprise environment. So as you walk a consultant or walk an user uh, through the environment, uh, they will see not just the widget on the desk, not just the slide deck, not just a video of how it was running last week during a, you know, an exercise. They see a living, breathing ecosystem from edge, outdoor to on. And the, the reason is, is for true uh, evaluation of technologies. And, and mm -hmm. really, I think to accelerate the adoption, people have to see it in use, right? So how many times have you gone to a customer's GSOC and you've walked in, you have to see stuff running, you see all the alarms coming in, you understand the telemetry, you see out in the field. For real enterprise production systems, typically you've got to go into a Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 customer environment. Not everybody has that accessible. Mm -hmm. We want to put this together in a learning environment and be able to put uh, together classes and training of workshops. You know, uh, let's have a, a workshop on developing policy, uh, how to implement identity access management, how to implement API, for example, right? And have uh, speakers come in that are subject matter experts and get clear information out there, right? And by having to be independent, there may be some sponsors here or there, but it's not logo saying, our product does it all, you know, when in reality, we may only get you 80% of the way that you really need to go specifically. And so having very candid conversations in that. So that's it. Keep, uh, you know, keep your uh, ear to the ground on, on timing for that. But like I said, we're talking to a number of manufacturers. And um, that's just what we're very excited about. Because, again, take everything we know about the technology, everything we've seen, putting in technologies, good partners that are out there. Some companies resonate with the end user. They're very good partners. Some fail. Very quickly, you know, <laughs> and uh, some have had some trouble. So having a, a clear form to have those candid conversations for the purpose of advocating for the end user who's trying to shop in today's environment to improve their security program. Another mouthful, but um, I feel like that's something we're, we're very passionate about. Certainly at ESI, and that's been something I've been chasing for quite some time as well. You know, in the I've done several proof of concepts in my day. And I would say that the extensiveness you explained was super interesting to me because it's not necessarily just on the tech, but it's also, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's get out, take away the rose cover glasses mm -hmm. and let's get really focused on like what's important. And then just kind of, let's say unfold all of it to figure out what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. Right. And one of the things when I've worked a lot with enterprise customers in the past, and e even as I think about something as potentially broad spoken as AI, I find that one of the hardest things would be is to, you know, find out while there's general use cases of where it could fit, there's also an aspect where the customer certainly knows that they're not necessarily general. And that every customer could be different, right? Yeah. But you know, there's one aspect where it's like problem solution, and I've always been a big fan of how we extrapolate what the problem is down to the root cause, yeah. but elevating someone's awareness around something that's happening that's costing them a ton of money, and what ends right. up happening as opposed to it implementing something that increases productivity. Sure, obviously, right? But the other side of the coin is there's a lot going on wrong right now that you just need to fix with yeah. or without AI. And I think that getting to that point and mobilizing a group around this common idea is really hard to do. 
So it's almost like it's not just I find that when I look at the end user journey, even as a an enterprise salesperson, I always think in the get go of why are we here? Why does it matter? Because we because all that's going to dictate where we go, right? Yeah. And not necessarily do we go down the rabbit hole of testing these things, leave the electronics out of the room, and let's have a war room conversation around what's going on. And I think that it's 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 very refreshing to me to think at least from a consultative standpoint, like where you came from, you come from, or even for me, I think I'm in kind of in the same realm a little bit, yeah. just on the manufacturing side, that you have the opportunity to sit down with people and really figure that out as a, as you called it, an SME in your space. Yeah. Uh, because ultimately, when do you get a chance to do that? I mean, customers that let's say work in loss prevention or global security leaders they have so much going on that for them to sit down and talk about credentials of access control for an hour, they rarely get that opportunity. And yeah. so they have folks like you and I maybe that can have that conversation to say, let's figure out uh, this these sorts of conversations. And then as we expand on where the opportunities are, where we find, excuse me, where the opportunities are, those are the segments where we should then talk about AI. Because, And I find that some balance between broad use cases, general use cases, and problem-centered uh, ideas, if those things come together, then we have a substance that we can start the journey on, you know? Yeah. And you remind me of uh, another point too, right? You know, a, another thing I do and a, a number of experts in our field do is um, I, I remember walking um, the uh, GSX floor with the CTO or CIO of uh, Stanley way, 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 mm-hmm. way back when. And he looks at me, he's like, how do you make sense out of all of this? How do you keep track of all these technologies? Because everybody's just shouting that their camera's the best. I swear, you know, and this over here, and you got this and this. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, at some point, the technologists, right, and in the SI, we have a, a number of technologists on. We, we've seen and, and we look at it. And, and there's a couple of things, right? I know talking to some colleagues that have been burnt out. Wow, I don't want to talk to another manufacturer. I'm like, I have to. I have to talk because that could be the next iPhone. I, I need to understand. Mm-hmm. And what I found is a way to to kind of manage the, the way through that is help them out. If, maybe if they really are a, a nascent innovator. Okay, great. Well, here are some of the best in the industry. And here's why I feel that way as an integrator, technologist, or whomever. And uh, I like this about your product. Or I like that. I give them some feedback to help them out. But I have to go devour and digest the entire plane to as much as I can. And I rely on mm-hmm. colleagues everywhere. I'll get an article. Hey, did you see this? I'm like, I did not see that. Thank you for sending it to me, right? So it, you just can't be aware of everything. And I try to deliciously digest everything. So I can back up and I go, okay, what are the trends? If this year's show at ISC or at GSX or you know some regional or some more bespoke show, what did I see? <clears throat> These are the top three things in an executive format. I saw, Don, I saw uh, AI is now going to land, right, with some products that could be modular, you could buy, you could put in, and with minimal uh, professional services effort, you could actually be using it in the next week. And that's a big mm-hmm. deal because it was all so ethereal at that point. Physical security equipment is now becoming hardened. They, they, they put it into their DNA, into their, their batter. And so now when you open up the hood on, on a number of products today, you will see elements of cyber governance already in their UI, taking care of their IoT, or their, their main servers, hardening guides, things like that. I have to go through that whole show and back up. And then there'll be a couple of new kind of bleeding edge. Hey, cool innovation here. I, I saw a drone do this, or I saw uh, an AI piece do this, or I saw you know, a badge that did something. And that's kind of it. <clears throat> but my job was to digest all of that and then bring it back to maybe a non-technical executive and explain the highlights. So they're at least aware now of trends, major trends in the industry. And then those get kind of bookmarked so that as you're briefing a customer, there can be a technology brief, and I've done that, state of the industry, and here's the cool new things that are going on, here's the major uh, new threats in our space, here's what's happening, et cetera. Something in there may resonate, and then you have a, a follow-up conversation to begin zeroing in. So that's actually the consultative, as far as prescribing, um, it's more of an education, but in a cliff note executive summary format that doesn't bludgeon a non-technical person, right? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because when I compare what I was saying earlier 
or when I contrast against what I said earlier about um, all of the changes that are happening in this space, in the AI space in general, there's a lot. Physical security, certainly there's a lot as by way of that. Um, it's harder today for anyone to keep up with what's going on. Bar none. I mean, you almost have to have someone that's going to spend that time because the reality is for any end users that are listening, to, even to this session, that uh, you got day jobs, right? And yeah. those day jobs have to be fulfilled. I mean, I work at a very, pretty big company and I know my day job is very consumed. I have zero time to look into uh, productivity tools for my team, right? Yeah. Um, let's say, right? But the reality is, I think of them in their shoes to say, if it was hard keeping up in the past of what was innovative or um, applicable for me, it's going to get way harder with everything that's changing because we're going to start seeing a lot of manufacturers pop up with new ideas um, in this industry. Um, we're going to see, uh, you know, end users building their own things in this industry when they start to work with convolutional networks and they're building out their own let's let's say in that sense computer vision models uh leveraging someone else's camera yeah. they'll be surprised you know so yep. uh i know actually some customers that won't be named that that uh have done that and they have their their own teams that will build those out yep. and so uh they're looking for solutions actively and i think that today is a great opportunity for these customers as they go through this journey this buying journey to one consider their time and talk to people you know, in the industry that's been around for a while that can do the work, right? Like yeah. Lance. Um, but also consider the fact that, um, you know, whatever, to be honest, whatever they buy today might not necessarily be what they need tomorrow. And that's how fast things are changing. So I'd imagine that, and this is a question I have for you, Lance, is when you're recommending solutions, an AI solution to an end user, knowing how fast changing the landscape is like how do you prepare them for tomorrow like yeah. i mean obviously it's kind of loaded right but it's answer it however you want but i find that they buy something today how do they how do they use that for this you know next two to three years or five years yeah. um what do you in this that's conversation really of ai and fisec what do you do what do you how do you handle that problem yeah that, that's a fantastic question uh so two-part answer first is again I need to determine their technology metabolism. Uh, I've had end users grab me by the nose ring and say, look, we're already leveraging all these things. What can you do for me today? To, and, and you gotta kind of run to catch up with their program, understand what they're doing. They, they have a, yeah. an element of spend where they can go into, you know, they don't have to show an ROI. They, they have an early adoption culture. And um, <clears throat> sometimes because you have, especially in big tech companies, they need for innovation around every coffee pot and, you know, chair, mm -hmm. <clears throat> they'll adapt the, the latest and greatest just because they can and push that envelope. And that's safe for them, right? That's not a waste. They, they, they do that. They have it. They're, they're driving those manufacturers forward. And then, like I said, on the, the other end of the spectrum, you have people that are um, maybe a little more conservative because um, they trust internal technology people that maybe stopped learning five years ago, or maybe they know one or two products really well, and that's their world. So I got to find out what their, their metabolism is, what their internal culture is. Is IT friend or foe? Or have they, have they messed up things with their IT department by trying to sneak stuff on their network, right? Once you get all that, you get an idea of, of how ready they are and, and what they can adopt to. Um, <clears throat> I'm a data junkie. So the second part of that answer is your data hygiene, your data architecture, your data governance. It's got to be under control whether you're using spreadsheets. Um, or the latest cloud, you know, hybrid. You know, you do Azure AD to another cloud engine with identity access management, moving down to the similar access control systems. You have that, that whole thing. But if you're not controlling your data, and especially a data adverse or risk company, um, it's a disservice to you for me to keep adding platforms where you may not have the purview to really make sure those things are being audited correctly. It's that with Healthcare companies were legal. HR already sat down and went, okay, we're putting the biometric reader on our front. Where's the data stored? And they were savvy. They knew, you know, the, where the, the, uh, the blob was going to be stored in this SQL database at this point. And then they approved it. Boom, 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 right there. That was, that was pretty impressive. 
Mm-hmm. But data hygiene, data ownership, data planning, data accessibility, I think will transcend um, whatever iteration of technology we're on at this point. You know, if, if you don't have your data together correctly, um, and it, it can weigh different things for different companies, right? Like I said, some are very data heavy, some are not. Um, but I find some of those cultural practices and policies need to be in place no matter what technology you're considering. Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a whole lot of FOMO that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, and because as things are changing so quickly, because I, and, and you've been in the industry, I think, longer than me. I've only been in the industry for like 12 years. But from my understanding, acts control could lay in place. I mean, I think someone told me there was a system they saw, an acts control system that was almost 30 years old. Right. But generally, I've told customers about 10 year refresh sometimes on access. And on the video side, it can be three to five. Right. Mm-hmm. Be- you know, you see 1080p versus uh, everyone's standard at homes of 4K. And yeah. you're like, what is this? Like, I don't want 1080p. Like, but 1080p five years ago was some hot stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and there, but uh, that's a simple example to say that um, I wonder with everything happening. Cause the thing is like the hardware is the hardware. I don't know how much expansive the hardware, the hardware has some limitation, but I wonder that when, when, if I was, let's say if I'm, I'm a consultant or if I'm an end user, I'm thinking about this journey to say it is when we buy a physical security thing or probably anything in your organization, it's not necessarily necessarily what's going to happen to me uh, three years from now. It's where I'm going to be a year from now. And to say, is this going to evolve with the times uh, with my needs as they scale? Because things could change. One minute, um, you know, you could have regular Word, and the next minute you have Word with Copilot tomorrow, yeah. right? Just simple examples. So things change all the time with this. And I think that we have an interesting challenge as an industry, uh, it co- and users have an interesting challenge themselves to make yeah. sure when they buy something that even a year from now, that it doesn't need a technology refresh. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how how they can adapt and how they don't get FOMO as a result of it. Well, and that's a good point, because even though people might suspect that a lot of hardware may not need a refresh, um, mm-hmm. you get a real OT, uh, SCADA, or IoT expert mm-hmm. in the room, um, they're going to start asking about chipsets and protocols for your mm-hmm. basic equipment back in the boiler room that mm-hmm. nobody's going to pay attention to. So you start looking at some of the black swan news events where, you know, heating and air thermostat was the, the entry point. Somebody was mm-hmm. able to park on the OS there, get on the Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. month-long campaign to attack and escalate inside the company. And that, that mm-hmm. brought down a major retailer, right? Mm-hmm. So you get um, OT experts, especially if you're in uh, anything with equipment, heavy field equipment, uh, smart city, critical infrastructure, <laughs> water, oil, gas, pipeline, et cetera. There's a whole other battleground that does not always get addressed. And so you, you mentioned some of the, uh, the panels and things. Um, I have kept an eye on access control and intrusion hardware manufacturers who have mm-hmm. been awake um, to the cybersecurity threat. Because some of mm-hmm. those panels actually have a web servlet. And if it goes in as default, that thing's just hanging in the breeze. That's a hacker's dream because they're scanning the whole network. They're, they're not physically going through your 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 uh, facility, checking each closet. No, here's what I wonder what that panel. They literally just hit the network and and they'll find something that'll ping back, databases. What am I looking at? Oh, I'm looking at this brand of board and that, that's apparently in the 70s, all right, known exploits. Oh, I could do this, power down and get a, it'll now give me the IP of a gateway. And then, you know, there's just all these meticulous, um, you know, matriculations, if you will, where, where somebody can, start moving their way through. So the good manufacturers, even at a hardware level, have mandated, look, notice if you want encryption, um, you'll need to go to this version of firmware and, and chipset. Um, however, at a minimum, here's a hardening guide to make sure you've got the right ports turned off. You have to, those are critical. Those are things that need to be taken in uh, consideration. So any facilities or any physical security managers or integrators should also have a, um, a small book or folder of all the hardening guides for all the equipment from you know, modems to you know panels to, to whatever, um, including anything that's IP based, right? The whole IoT thing, uh, that's a critical. You, you really need to uh, be looking at IoT governance. I talked to uh, 
a major university one year. I start explaining um, the firmware updates and the requirements for all the edge devices, mm -hmm. right? Everything needs to be done. And, and gently, they looked at the end of it and, and, and back and forth. And everybody's like, well, was that being done? Well, that's not in scope for preventative maintenance. This was years ago. Well, they got rectified pronto because, um, again, as a hacker scanning the network, if they get onto even an air gap network, um, mm -hmm. they're going to find a whole range of things. And someone's going to query back. Someone's going to talk. Maybe a Linux um, known vulnerability on a certain camera. It may be, you know, a ping or, or just it could be anything. And so. Um, you know, you, when, sorry, to, that, this will take a can of worms when you got into the, the panels and existing infrastructure, a customer, it's got to be looked at. It really does. And just air gapping it or VLANing it, uh, right. is not a good guarantee. It may pass an audit scope per se, but, um, you really do want to do a pen test if your threat level is high enough to justify something like that. So the EU AI Act just got released, I think this week. Mm -hmm. Um, and how do you see, um, I, I've heard some talks or re read some articles where that could end up being uh, maybe a gold standard that's adopted or at the very least influence standards that are adopted in other parts of the world. Um, what do you think we're going to do in the United States? Now, obviously, we could have some global folks uh, that are tuning in, too. But um, I think certainly if you're going to see some standards coming across um the U.S. is going to have a really big impact on how they view that. I mean, Europe's already got GDPR. They were the first with that. It seems like um, you got an EU AI Act. But where do you think the U.S. is going to follow this? I mean, we got NIST, but it's a framework. I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily like a requirement, depending on if you're in a like OT space uh, or government space. Uh, it's a framework. But what do you think? It, what do you think we're going to have some version of the EU AI Act in the U.S. Or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I see. so uh, you know you mentioned GDPR. Let's take that as maybe a precedent. So again, to your point, this has been there for quite some time, right? But we don't uh, require commercial entities to enforce at that level. It's really as a voluntary need, uh, unless they're federal, and then they they must adhere to those guidelines. Um, so we've had that for quite some time. We've had computer privacy law since uh, mid seventies. Um, but GDPR did something different. It put it in lay terms and it put mm -hmm. real financial teeth behind it. And it spelled out succinctly user rights, you know, privacy rights, the right to be forgotten, the right to know what you're being solicited for, how your data is being used, and to opt out at a point. And um, they gave it far reach. So even if in the US I have a, an EU employee or somebody who is in my system, it will still affect me. Mm -hmm. um, Stateside, you're seeing a number of states implement laws, right? You got BIPA, Illinois, that's been around for a while for uh, consent to enrollment. Um, you have the California Consumer uh, Act and uh, information mm -hmm. there. Arkansas, Colorado, a few others are, are implementing a state by state basis. So, so that part is coming into be, but it really, I think, took the GDPR to say, okay, look, NIST exists, right? We understand the framework and the reality mm -hmm. of it. It's got to be enacted in a layperson protocol in a way it does it. My hope would be it would be the AI element will do something similar for that. However, I think it's a little premature because AI hasn't emerged fully yet. I think it's mm -hmm. it's saying, hey, I'm in I'm in the fight, I'm in the mm -hmm. in the mix right now, and this will evolve as rapidly as AI does. So kudos to them for that. Usually I try to architect and advise even stateside according to those because those principles make sense they're not egregious typically they're not uh superfluous you know or it, it's not a waste it, for the right reasons and maybe because it's it's newer laws and they have time to gain some bloat or excess baggage but um that's my hope is that uh, the uh, ai piece will have a similar impact but again i think the technology hasn't fully arrived yet because why on the tail of this you know quantum right computing mm -hmm. and i think the estimates are Maybe as early as 2030, you can start seeing devices being available accessibly. Um, and that's going to impact it because your encryption's out the window and um, all of that. So they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to have some wake up calls and say, look, US government, other entities, don't be late adopters, don't wait and see. The challenge is do you invest in all the infrastructure to test and examine when in 18 months, all that investment's going to be obsolete because it will evolve. So a lot of people don't want to take on that that hit, they let other people do that 
testing and, and early adoption. Um, but the deal is, whoever gets there first with quantum or, or truly well applied AI is going to have a massive dominance in their, their technical arena, right? So that's it. That's a long answer to your uh, your law question, but there you go. Yeah. And uh, you may have opened a can of worms for me on the quantum because that, I mean, that's a whole different ball of wax, even on the end user's journey when they decide to buy this stuff. I don't know that we get that complex. Maybe we will on the physical security side, but Mm -hmm. most certainly if there's IT end users uh, and you have a large organization, it might most certainly come up for you. I mean, you're right. There's a race on the commercializing quantum compute because right now on average, they're probably like, I don't know, five to $10 million for one setup. And they have to be at like, uh, the chip has to be colder than space. Now, what is you know? most constant? It says every 18 months. And I think yeah. that's actually been shrunk lately, right? That the CPU yep. doubles in power. And now mm-hmm. with the, the innovation, it's actually shrinking. But the minute mm-hmm. I can take a flipper zero into your facility with quantum decryption or, or yeah. quantum capability, bring your whole network down, have everybody else log right back onto yeah. my device and, and blow through any of it. Um, mm. It will be a physical security concern pretty quickly. That's right? when I think real machine wars will happen, right? Yeah. Because the idea, the only way you can fight, you cannot, you can fight classical with people to a degree, yeah. right? But you can't fight quantum with people. It's on a whole nother spectrum. And considering yeah. every avenue uh, of a thing that is unimaginable. And that's the thing around, we think about Gen AI is that, it's just generating the next, it's it's predicting the next mm-hmm. thing that can happen. So with the next pixel in an image, yep. right? Or the next word to fill out the phrase. Um, the idea though is it's, and this is just for audience, anyone that doesn't know, that it's leveraging a bunch of data, large yep. language model, where there's different models, convolutional and neural net, convolutionals for images, video. And then you've got neural networks, which is on the tech side. And then you also have Codex, which is on uh, to predict code language. But that's running on a classical computer that lives in a very binary space. Now you throw it on a quantum and it lives in a quantum space. And the, really the big difference between those two is classic runs on, um, runs on uh, trans, I think it's transistors. Yep. And then you've got quantum that runs on electrons. Right. And when it runs on electrons, it's basically the idea, if you can imagine like an atom, that's just mm-hmm. move electrons moving around. It's giving you every scenario of a thing. So if I yeah. say, give me a picture of a dog, it could it could think of every image of a dog that could probably ever exist. Yeah. Whereas in a classical, it's going to be limited based on its input. So meaning yeah. that the intelligence scale of quantum is like on a whole nother level. And that's a really interesting future. There's a guy, I forget the guy, it's a uh, white hair physicist. He has a book called Quantum Supremacy. I want to I want to buy it and read it. Um, but this is such an interesting future. But even at that, right, if we think about our space, I would imagine once they commercialize quantum, we'll start see we'll start seeing that and like you said, I mean flippers will will be the uh the white hat side, hopefully, and we'll see the bad actors. But I'm thinking yeah. like even down to the edge of the camera would be yeah. amazing. Now, I don't know what kind of world we're gonna be by then, but with the respect to technology advancement, that's what we're talking about is from an end user's perspective, as they go on this journey, there's a lot to consider. And so I think as we start to wrap up, um, one of the things that I heard you say earlier, I just want to bring it back, is the proof of concept testing. I think if an end user is out there looking for solutions, definitely get some testing and then think about, am I going to feel FOMO in the next year? And right. think about like I, how can I scale this and get other parts of the organization to get a share wallet to be convinced because right. physical security isn't limited physical security personnel. It's not limited to asset protection people anymore. This thing is, especially with the proliferation of AI, is scaling across all departments. And so I would say that uh, the proof of concept testing, from my experience, and I'd love to have for you to have the last word on that, um, and then we'll work to wrap up. Um, from my experience, it's something that gives the customer an opportunity to figure out how do I take this ideation, this hypothetical theoretical and turn it into practicality where I can more easily have a conversation or or let's say an internal buy in my organization 
Um, that's the best way to do it. Now, if you're a large organization, you have that ability. If you're a small company, it might be a little harder. Um, but the reality is, really big yeah, organizations yeah. that are feeling the pain of not people or mm-hmm. uh, wishing to around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and to answer your question, uh, for me, the, the secret sauce I learned probably many years ago around use cases, right? Let me sit down and talk to you. How do you use your system? How do you use your facility? How do you look? And users go through your day to day. Um, you know, how do you bring on a new batch? How do you get rid of some of the permissions? How do you respond to this type of incident? What's the call list? What's it? And you map out an entire library of, you know, theoretically, here's all the things that we could foresee happening. And here's the remediation plan for all of those, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that use case, after shopping for different um, products and technologies, sometimes it's not just one product that will handle that entire use case. It has to be integrated. Uh, mm-hmm. And maybe aggregated with other data because it might become more complex. Certainly, as you're looking into better AI or BI or whatever in the hell, you're looking at does this ecosystem serve these use cases correctly? And out of all these use cases, I try to provide you that here's tech stack A, here's tech stack B, here's tech stack C. So it's logo agnostic. You, you know, with an access control, there's two or three or four major enterprise ones that will have these features this type of rule set, this type of policy workflow, et cetera. So these are the ones you want to look at. Uh, we already invested in that. Does it integrate well with your GSOC software? By the end of starting with how you're going to use it, after you've been updated on what could be done, uh, I want to add a few new uses, right? Because the new technology I wasn't aware of. You map out that library of use cases. And then you have to do that proof of concept to say, okay, in order to accomplish use case one, two, five, eight, these three technologies need to be put together in the lab. Here's how we'll test it. We'll be boom, boom, boom. We'll start with an HR plant. It'll be this. It'll be rescinded. It'll go to dawn for approval. You build that out. And you literally test it to the nines the way it will be used in that piece. When you get to an enterprise class set of use cases, it becomes a little more complex. Um, and a lot of people aren't ready to have that kind of staying power to really sit down and say, okay, we're going to hammer this thing out for you. So that in six months, twelve months, or whatever, your team is rolling. I mean, you, you've got your SLAs, you've got your all of your your elements there, right? You got it, and you know for sure you've purchased the right product. Uh, you have the right ROI on the licensing. That's a big one. I always try to warn people: check the annual recurring licensing because a lot of these deaths uh, with, with their annual recurring. Uh, so yeah, to to mention that it, it really comes down to for the proof of concept: what are your use cases? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a good. Good way to wrap this up. So you may have said this earlier, but um, if not, or it, or if you did, you're welcome to repeat it. Um, if not, I uh, would love to uh, hit, learn more. I'm sure the audience would too. So tell the audience something that you're working on now, and uh, uh, which is uh, just and something you're excited about, right? Yeah. So um, right now, uh, working with a, a number of end users for exactly a lot of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're also working with a number of manufacturers or at ESI to talk to. Um, there's a lot of big players coming into the space with AI, whether it's an edge um, you know, processor or if it's a software layer or some kind of cloud engine or something. Um, we're trying to talk to a lot of manufacturers about how they play well in an ecosystem. Instead of just coming to you and saying, I've got my one thing, explain it, and then come in partnered with a complementary technology, right? Maybe mm-hmm. I need to call you because you sell X and I sell Y. Mm-hmm. Now we jointly call on each other's Rolodexes. And so there's a lot of strategies there to begin addressing a more complex solution set. Um, also working on, um, I, I say, buyer's guide or implementation guides, right, based on a specific vertical. As I mentioned, tech stack A, B, and C. You know, what would meet the top five use cases for a given area or something like that. So those are uh, how much we engage customers with, and uh, we're very excited about that type of element. You got to see me copy that buyer's guide. Anywho, so where can the audience find you? Okay, well, uh, we are at esiconvergent.com, and um, go to the website there. Yep, esiconvergent.com. And uh, if you go in there and uh, fill out a uh, form, also, I'm at lance at esiconvergent.com. That's convergent with an E, not an I. Um, I had to clarify for a few people there. So, 
Either way, uh, reach out to us to be uh, be thrilled to have a conversation. Hey, drop. Uh.